Good morning, friends, and welcome to Meeting House Church. We are so glad you're joining us today. My name is Trev Erickson, and I'm the communications manager here. Before the service begins, I wanted to take a minute to help orient you to worshiping with us online. Check out the description of this stream below where you'll find helpful links for you to get the most out of today's service. You'll find PDFs of our handouts, links to learn more about our community, and even ways to submit prayer requests. And of course, you can always find these things at meetinghouse.church. If you'd like to get more connected in our community, an easy first step is to text CONNECTMC to 55498. As we're getting ready to start this morning, send a message in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from today. And from all of us here at Meeting House Church, welcome. Welcome to worship. Uh, we had obviously intended to be outside, but uh, Mother Nature had different plans for us today, and I'm sure we're all thankful for some rain. Um, nevertheless, we still get to gather together to worship, uh, to fellowship with one another, to be knit together and built up to hear God's word. So welcome, and welcome to our friends also online. As you prepare yourself for worship, as you Center yourself to hear God's word in the midst of all the other words that will be spoken and sung today. Hear this short passage from the book of Revelation. Great and amazing, great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord, who will not reverence and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. Brothers and sisters, as you're able, please rise as we worship together. Please stand.
may be seated. That was fun. We haven't sung those songs in a while. Al and say thank you. Al and say if you have not visited our alternative service, they're some of the wonderful musicians that play every week uh, in that service, and they lead the, the music, and uh, we're grateful for their talent in our midst. Matter of fact, let's thank them again just for being here with us today. The good news, friends, is that we are together in worship. We're in this safe place where the church gathers and we get renewed and refreshed and redirected and then sent out again to the world. We do that by listening to God's word. We do that by enjoying the fellowship with one another. But we also do it by combining and thinking about the ways that we pray, the ways that we bring our concerns, our hopes, our gratitude, our faith. So let's pause now and entrust into God's care those things that are heavy on your heart and on your mind, and then I will lead us. Let us pray. God, we are grateful, grateful to be together, grateful for your church that has been sustained and survived for 2,000 years. As you left this world, and you entrusted into faithful people to carry on the work that they had seen in your life, Jesus, to do the work of caring one another, of bringing hope, and to sharing the good news of what, oh God, you have done in Jesus for the world Grateful that, for the hope that that offers us, a hope that is not a wishful hope, but a sustaining hope, a hope that we can experience in this world and a hope that carries us into the next. Grateful for little songs that have been around the church for some time that reminds us that we can let that light shine a light that you placed in our heart and our soul by the presence of your spirit, that we can have our path illuminated and walk in faith, trusting your leading, but also we can share a little bit of light for the world around us. We can get caught up in the darkness of this world. There is so much that is happening around us. Uncertainty with our finances, unbrokenness in our politics, war in Ukraine, unrest in China. There is so much that we could focus on, be worried about, be overwhelmed by. But then there's that light that you give us, that light that can sustain us, that light that reminds us that you are with us, promise to be with us will never leave us or forsake us. And so we rest on that hope, mustering our faith to trust that each day. You are a God of blessings. And so God, we're grateful for just life this day that we don't take for granted. A day that you give us to see the beauty of the world around us, to enjoy the friendship of a loved one and a neighbor to use our gifts and abilities and talents. And then you give us that hope again, a hope for tomorrow and the day after. God, we long to be your people, to be a blessing to the world around us. We pray for your wisdom and discernment, for for clarity. We're grateful for the tasks that you've given this community to care well for our kids and our youth and our families, to teach your scriptures, to gather your people, to remember to worship. So God, we entrust our needs, our concerns, our hopes, our dreams into your care in this very hour. 
God, we are excited for our elementary age kids that we're sending off to camp. Camp is one of those amazing places where away from the normative life, your spirit can work in wonderful ways. And we pray that through the activities and the cabin times and the speakers and all of what they'll experience, just the beauty of your nature, that they will come to a deeper understanding of you and a deeper faith in you. We ask a blessing upon them and their families as the week ahead of us unveils. We are mindful of needs in our own congregation and we continue to pray for those folks that need your special healing touch. We ask that you would be with Steve Fountain as he heals. Be with our brother Dave Getch when he needs your encouragement he needs your hope. He needs your healing hand. And be with our sister Lynn Tetschendorf as she continues to heal. We long for those days when those brothers and sisters who are back in our midst. Those are the ones that we know of this day, but we know there are others. Others who are still healing. Others who need your healing touch. Others who are facing procedures and surgeries and uh, uncertainty. And so Lord bless them, draw near to them might they sense your presence in a way that is helpful for them and sustaining for them grateful for the new life in the greater Richardson family, thank you for Riker's little life the grandson of Steve and Linda Richardson and other new life in our midst we're grateful for our children, especially these little babies that remind us that you are a God of life and the hope that new life brings. Bless that child, their family, as they seek to be all that they can be to encourage little Riker's life. We know because you've declared it in your word that you're a God of comfort. You long for us to sense your presence in a way that helps us to keep on keeping on. And so we ask for your spirit to bring that comfort, especially for Steve Fountain and the death of his sister, for Cindy Bennett and her family uh, as they grieve the death of Greg Bennett, and for others who have experienced grief in these past days but maybe are still experiencing grief from, from loss from time ago. May they sense your presence in a way that helps them, brings them a peace that's beyond their understanding. We're grateful, God, that you're a God who hears our prayers. And so we pray these prayers in faith. Now hear us as we pray together that prayer you taught your disciples saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive others. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, obviously this wasn't the decision that we made. We really were hoping we'd be out in the courtyard last month. It was so much fun being out there if you weren't being blinded by the rising sun. It was just fun to do something different. But here we are in our familiar setting together with our wonderful friends of faith. If you're joining us online, we're glad that you're with us. Make, make sure that you uh, continue to look through the bulletin and look through the uh, e-news and things. Find other ways that you can connect with the life of this church because we would love for you to experience the fullness of this fellowship as much as you are able. And of course, those who are in other places around the country, Texas and uh, New Jersey and Maryland and other places, we're grateful that we can be your family of faith, even from that distance. And you know who you are. So we'd love to just to share a few quick announcements so you're aware of what's happening. Of course, as I say that you can always go to the e-news that comes out on Wednesdays. If you don't get that, we'd love to, for you to sign up for that. Or you can go on our website, because again, it has all the updated information. But this week, we're highlighting a few things. 
our last backyard Bible uh, uh, barbecue, I keep saying that. Have you been, I, I don't know what my problem is. Backyard barbecue. Our last one is August 14th. It's going to be um, at the uh, uh, Garber's house. And uh, I think there's still a few spots. If you want to go online and sign up for that, they would love to have you come. And I think it will be uh, pretty yummy and it'll be a chance for you to maybe meet some new friends and greet some old friends. We are going to have, uh, again, another music in the courtyard. That'll be August 17th. That's a Wednesday. There'll be some yummy food starting at 6, and then there'll be some music from uh, our current and uh, old chorale members. There'll be some old hits and some fun new hits. Uh, so, uh, again, chance to be out in the courtyard enjoying God's creation, but also be together and, and uh, hear some good music and eat some good food together. Uh, some of you might remember that a couple years ago, we uh, built a tiny house. It was a, it was a mission trip in our parking lot. And uh, we did this beautiful house, and uh, we sent it off. It's now finally getting settled into a little neighborhood in St. Paul with other tiny houses that other churches have built, and, uh, and this little community will be uh, formed. We are building another one this summer. And uh, we would love for you to be involved. Uh, it will be starting on the August 18th. And there's, there's lots of ways that you could participate in that project. Uh, so I would invite you to stop out at the table that's in uh, North Common today uh, and ask some questions, find out what's available, and sign up. It'll be a chance for you to, again, be with some of your members uh, who are doing this uh, project and a chance really to be a blessing to the future owner of that house. And you can sign up online if you like. I have a little help over here. So there's lots of ways for you to connect with that. So those are some of the announcements this week. There's other announcements uh, online and uh, in our e-news and in our bulletin today. Lastly, uh, we were hoping to create uh, some fun space out in the courtyard for our kids. We're not there. But we have some special activities. Uh, there's some bags in the common. If you didn't bring one coming in, you're more than welcome to go out there and get it now so that uh, you can be doing some fun stuff that we're doing uh, along with us in the service. Uh, we're glad that we could be together. We're glad that families and kids can be with us today as well. And now we continue in worship as we read our scripture. Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture reading for today is from the book of James, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and it itself sets on fire by hell. For every species of beast and birds, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does the spring pour, pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray, brothers and sisters. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Living God, we give thanks to you for this day 
And we pray that amidst all the words we hear today, that your word will come through to give us new life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I think after Anne read that passage, I was like, all right, we can go. <laughs> it's great to be able to be here and to spend some time with you today. Uh, obviously, we wish we could have been outside. Uh, that was certainly the plan, and I have like a whole thing here in my intro about being outside, the beautiful weather, etc. So I'm, I'm going to scrap over that and uh, toss that to the side, because today we, we got a certain a curveball. Now, as, uh, as many of you know, this summer we have been uh, traveling through the book of James, um, which I think it's fair to say, and you've heard this kind of uh, iterated, and I'll say it again in just a minute, it's one of the most polarizing books in all of the Bible. The sermon series uh, has been titled Faith and, and the idea has been to see the many different ways in which our faith is meant to intersect with our lives. In fact, the, the overarching idea is that really there is no area of our life that should be cordoned off from our calling to be followers of Jesus. And what we say, which obviously this passage today deals with that, is certainly no exception. Now, as You've heard in different sermons already, I think I heard Andrew say it, I think you might have said it, Sarah might have said it, but I wasn't there. Uh, Martin Luther, in particular, did not like the book of James. He didn't think it belonged in the canon. He didn't care for this book, and he thought, uh, the reason, of course, is that he thought it didn't have much to say about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be teaching a class, as it turns out, in the fall on the Reformation, so I'm kind of brushing up a little bit on my Luther. And it's fair to say that some of his criticisms of the book of James are very much shaped by his own fights with late medieval Catholicism. But I have to be honest, as I was sitting with this passage and working on this particular passage this week, and the difficult words that it bears, I could feel the weight of Luther's criticism and his complaints. I wish I didn't have to speak on these verses. And not the least because I'm called your quote unquote teaching minister. This is a hard book to read. And our passage today in particular is a tough one, strong medicine. In some ways, it's a pretty straightforward message. It says our words can be deadly and they can be in fact as deadly and as dangerous as our actions. But it says it with a very, very pessimistic view of people. This is, I would suggest to you, the kind of passage that if you don't sit with it for a while and bring it into dialogue with other parts of scripture, it can really beat you up. Now, before I jump into the passage itself, uh, I do want to say that I think in spite of the negative, which is so obvious in this passage, that there's actually something quite positive underneath that James is trying to say to us. And I've come to the conclusion that it, it can be stated as follows, that his real message is this, let your words like your actions, reflect the love and mercies of God. Let me repeat that. Let your words, like your actions, reflect the mercies of God. Now we don't know the exact historical setting of James, but it's fair to say that he was very concerned for the integrity and the wholeness of the communities to which he was writing. If you read the book as a whole, he's constantly urging on these communities, often in a very exaggerated way, and I would suggest that that's an element that's happening in our passage itself. 
He's urging them to let their common life together to be shaped by the life of God. And who is this God? Not just what is this God's name, the fact that this God is associated with Israel. Rather, who? What's the character of this God? And James sprinkles that idea throughout the letter. He says that God is filled with compassion and mercy. He says that God is the source of all wisdom, the one to whom whom humankind should turn, and that the wisdom of God is also filled with mercy and good fruit. And in a statement that I have to say is one of my favorites, maybe in all of scripture, he tells us that, quote, mercy triumphs over judgment. The God whose life the Christian community, to whom James was writing, but also to us, the God whose life those communities are being urged to be shaped by is a God of compassion, a God of mercy, and a God of love. And so James, as we learned last week, says to these communities, you say that you believe in the God of mercy, and yet you do not show mercy or compassion in your common life. Your actions do not match your confession of faith. Your works is the sort of theological terminology I suppose we run into. Your life does not line up with what you say. His call is a constant refrain that you can hear going all the way back into the Hebrew Bible and all the way up to today. Learn to imitate God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do not show partiality to the wealthy and the powerful. Care for the least of those in your midst. Care for the poor. Now our text closes the circle in some respects on this very broad message that we find in James. And that's because it takes up the call for our actions to match or be matched by our words. It reminds us that our words also need to imitate the mercy of God. And in a culture like ours, a culture awash in social media, a culture built on the fundamental right of freedom of speech, this is indeed strong medicine, but much needed. Now, I think this particular passage today, what we have is James speaking in a highly exaggerated way, at least in terms of the details. Though the underlying message he wants to get across to us is for us to realize that words can be as powerful as actions in the life of any community. That words just like actions can be sources of justice or injustice. They can wound or they can heal. They can be good or they can be evil. And that our calling and our task is to speak words ultimately that give life. Words that are shaped by the love and the mercy of God not by our own anger or pain or hatred. Now, to make this point, James starts his passage, uh, I'd say, in an obvious place. He talks to teachers in the community. He talks to me. He talks to you. He talks to anyone who has some level of authority with the words that they say. 
And that, that makes sense, doesn't it? If you're going to talk about the power of words, why not begin with those whose words are thought to carry some weight? And of course, it is entirely possible that James is actually addressing a real historical problem within the communities to which he's writing. It's been hypothesized that perhaps there were people setting themselves up as teachers who not only were they not qualified, but they had not yet grasped the weight that words can carry and the destructive power that they can have in a community. Perhaps they were not yet up to the task. They had not yet perhaps grasped that God is not a God of destruction, but rather of life. Either way, James only sticks with the teachers for just a little bit. Almost immediately after the initial warning, he, in which he says that not everyone should be a teacher, James widens his aperture to include anyone who can communicate, all of us. He says, for all of us make many mistakes, every single one of us. I would say that this is probably my second favorite portion of this passage. <laughs> uh, and of course, this includes James himself. His grammar here makes it clear that no one is exempt, not even the apostles. But this means that the, this shift, I should say, means that the challenges that any teacher would face in regard to their words, that this is also faced by anyone else in the community. Anyone who speaks, and we all must speak in one way or another, faces the same daunting challenge, which is what much of this passage really is about. And that is that the tongue is a dangerous weapon. From James's perspective, the old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, that is fundamentally wrong and misleading. And this is quite honestly a fact that I think many of us know only too well. Words spoken by people whom we might know, love, trust, or at the very least are in proximity to, they can traumatize. They can stick with you. And I don't have this in my sermon notes right here, but I can tell you when I was a professor and I would get my student feedback, yeah, you've got lots and lots of positives, but that one negative even if it was completely groundless, and often it was, <laughs> it still hurt, it stung. Our words, what we have to say to one another, and sometimes what we leave unsaid, these things have great power to harm or to heal. Now to develop this point, our passage offers a series of metaphors for the power of the tongue. James says, it's like a rudder on a ship. Though small, it guides the whole vessel. Or it's like the stirrups on a horse, which when you turn it from one way or another, is able to guide not only the whole animal, but the whole chariot. The point, of course, of these metaphors is quite simple. If someone can control their tongue, then they can probably control the rest of their lives. And by the way, just so you know, this is not, these images, this notion, this point that James is trying to make is not something that you only find in Christian religious writings. Rather, you can find this across the world, and certainly in James's own context, we find other Greco-Roman writers saying the same thing, other Jewish writers at the same time saying the same thing. But what is unique to James is his profound pessimism about our ability to control the tongue. James is clearly pessimistic whether or not we can, in fact, tame ourselves. 
He describes the tongue as a restless evil filled with deadly poison, a member of the body that sets fire and that is itself set fire by hell. That's pretty, that's pretty pessimistic. You know, when I was thinking about the power of the tongue to sow destruction, I kept thinking about certain movies that I had seen. Uh, there were a couple that came to mind. One of them you may or may not remember. This is all the way back from uh, back in the old days, 1988. Uh, the movie Dangerous Liaisons. I think it was remade recently. I haven't seen the remake. Um, maybe you could throw in a different one here, like Mean Girls, or you know, there are other ones like that that deal with all these movies deal with gossip and lies, and how those things can wreak havoc, sometimes leading to consequences that even the person who traffics in the falsehood doesn't expect. But of course, I also couldn't help but think about our own cultural moment. One sometimes here hears that we're living in a post-truth world. Lord, help us if that's true. And whatever your perspective on the events that happened on January 6, 2021, at the very least, the power of words to unleash chaos has very much been on trial during the hearings as they've gone on over the summer. All of this, James's pessimism, our own personal experience of the power of words can lead to the feeling, like you can honestly understand why some religious traditions have not only treasured but emphasized the need for silence, that to be silent is in fact a mark of wisdom. In fact, with all the pessimism that shows up in James, it's kind of surprising that you get to the end of the passage and he doesn't tell his readers to keep silent. That's not at all what we get. And this is why, of course, I think that this is an exaggeration, this portion of scripture. It's meant to tell us to warn us of the power of the tongue, but also to concede that we must speak to one another. Already at the beginning of James, the book of James, in the very first chapter, he gives great advice. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. He says later on, after our passage, we ought not to speak evil against one another, but rather we should speak from the wisdom that sows peace. Clearly, James assumes that we will speak, that we must speak, and that our speech will reach into the lives of others. Now, as I was reflecting uh, on the passage and on the message, there were a couple things that happened. The first was the conclusion, at least, of one of the trials being brought against Alex Jones and the conspiracy or lies that he had been telling about the Sandy Hook massacre that took place many years ago in Connecticut. Jones made massive amounts of money off of these claims and he was found guilty of lying and made to pay a significant amount of damages. But what really caught my attention as I watched this was not so much Jones and the feeling of like finally someone was held accountable. It was rather the testimony of the families from Sandy Hook who had had to live with those lies. The trauma upon trauma that was inflicted upon them after losing their children in a way that quite honestly is incomprehensible to me and I think probably to most people in this room, these families could find no space to grieve or mourn because they were attacked not only by Jones's lies, 
but by others who had been inflamed by them. That was what caught my attention. The ability of words to inflict almost incalculable harm. The second thing that happened was that it was a little closer to home. It was, uh, it was something that happened on social media. Someone that I really care about, but whom I have certainly disagreements with, they posted something really disturbing on social media. They, their post celebrated the sentence that had been handed down recently to Brittany Griner, the WNBA star who's been held in Russia for, I don't know, at least eight months, nine months now, for possession, basically, of medical marijuana. Never mind that she is clearly a political pawn in a, in a period of war, which is causing havoc and mayhem. Because she held different political views than this person, she was seen as fair game to be slandered and attacked. And I couldn't help but ask, why? Why would you post something like that? And I actually did write that. And my friend never responded to me, but the other answers I got from other folks on their feed, they were as sad as the post itself. Now both of these events point to the destructive power of words. And just so you don't think I'm just trying to hold a mirror up to other people, I can think of many, many conversations, some even recently which I have had, which I replay in my head again and again, wishing I had said something different. I had done something different. And we could, we could end this message, honestly, here, and just say, don't do that. <laughs> James is telling us not to do that, which is true. But as I alluded to at the beginning, I think there's also a positive message beneath the negative, an inverse Use your words for life. Let your speech be shaped by God's love and mercy. What does that look like? We can probably think of a lot of examples. I, again, I was drawn into thinking about some movies. The one that kept playing in my mind was a movie from the late 90s called Magnolia. It features a number of stars that you might recognize, people like Tom Cruise, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Julianne Moore, and John C. Riley. And it is rated R, so just as a warning, mostly for the language, which is, I think, intentional, because it's a movie about a lot of things, but one of the things most definitely is that it is a, word, it is a movie about the power or weakness of words. I would even call it a kind of parable of grace, though you have to travel through an awful lot of muck to get to the grace. But the movie basically brings together several different storylines over the course of about three hours. And at the end of the movie, all of these storylines begin to coalesce together. And there are several scenes where healing happens where it begins to happen, when true life-giving words are spoken, or where the truth of what someone has said is finally recognized. It's a genuinely beautiful movie. Now I believe what I'm describing here this movie in some small way captures the inverse of what James has had to say in our, in our, in our passage. That words of care, words of encouragement, 
words, even when they are long overdue, they can play a role in sowing peace in lives that are anything but peaceful. To bring it a little more close to home, let me make sure I got my hanky nearby. I can think about my own life and the words of truth that I have heard. In 2017, my mom died of cancer. And during the last two months of her life, I was able to be there with her in South Carolina with my wife and my dad. And my mom and I spoke several times. And through the, the haze of the opiate medication that they had given to her, we were able to connect on things that mattered things that you might call unfinished business. No one else heard those words but me. But to this day, I can still hear them. I go back to them from time to time because they re-empower me, they recenter me, they remind me that there is love in the world. I can remember what my mom said to me about us and about our relationship and about how she felt about life and death. Those, my friends, were words that gave life and they continue to give life to me. And of course, in all of this, this sobby personal story, which if you're shocked by this, then you don't know me. Uh, I keep thinking also, of course, of Jesus. Because in the end, that really is also what James is saying. Try to be more like Jesus also in your words. There is one passage that describes Jesus that's found in Isaiah 42. It says, quote, a bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. When I was ordained, these words were also given to me in my vocation as a teacher. And I've tried and certainly failed often to hold to them, but they have been a guiding light. Jesus, however, he did speak in that way. There are numerous places where we can see him speaking in such a way that even the faintest note of hope comes alive in the person who hears. Even the smallest possibility of love and life become magnified for those who hear his words. And this is to me what it means to, to live by these verses and what it might mean for us to be a people who let our actions and our words reflect the compassion and mercies of God. Now as we reflect on how we're gonna use our words in this world, I pray that we will find ways not to crush others, not to snuff them out or break them, and especially the others with whom we disagree. That we will learn to truly walk in the footsteps of Jesus which means to see the humanity in every person, even those who may not return the favor, perhaps especially 
those who will not return the favor. Our calling is to be a people who sow peace with our actions and our words. Let this be so. And when we fail, got to tip our hat to James, when we fail, or when others fail, with their words and their actions, to remember what James tells us, that mercy triumphs over judgment. May it be so. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we pray this day that your words will awaken us to the power of our own speech that we might sow peace and not discord, that we might sow love and not hatred. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. That, was, that is some tough scripture, and it's hard to hear that scripture. But it's a great reminder, just the power that we, we have in our words to do good and to, and to do evil. Are we grateful that we have a God of grace and mercy, and that in the midst of that understanding and the reality of life, that we can be set free from those choices that uh, fall short of God's desire for us and we can be renewed. Not just so we can get out from under the burden of those choices, but so that we can choose then to do better from there. Set free from the burden so that we have the energy and strength to focus on doing better, following the life of Jesus. Every communion Sunday is a chance for us to share a, a confession together to be reminded that we are all in this together, but also to be reminded that that same mercy and grace is for all. And then we then come to the table with a renewed sense of understanding of what God has done in Jesus for us and for the world. So let's take a moment and reflect on your own heart and your own life and maybe offer a word of confession and then I will lead us in our unison confession. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we confess that we have sinned for self-centered living and for failing to walk with humility and gentleness, have mercy on us. For conflict that divides families and nations and for rivalries that create strife and warfare, have mercy on us. For reluctance in sharing the gifts of God and for carelessness with the gift of creation, forgive us. For hurtful words that condemn and for angry deeds that harm, Have mercy on us. Heal us, O God. Renew us and lead us so that we might delight in your will and follow in your ways until the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. An absolute fitting prayer of confession uh, for your word for us today, Christian. If we've prayed that prayer, if we've asked for that grace and mercy, God is a good God and gives us that sets us free that we can continue to live as God calls us to. And that means we can have peace. And that same peace that we receive, we can then offer to others. So I invite you, friends, to stand and pass the peace to those around you. Good stuff, man.
I do, uh, I do love watching you share the peace and catch up with each other. I love watching community at work. I invite you back to your seats as we prepare. Please be seated. Hopefully you had a chance as you were coming in to pick up one of our little communion caplets as you came in. If not, uh, maybe you could raise your hand. Maybe one of the ushers could make sure that you get one so that everybody has one of those things. I know there's a couple up in the balcony that need some, so if somebody could run up to the balcony, that would be awesome. This table is open to all, and you are welcome to it. Open to all who are seeking to follow Jesus and are on the journey of faith. It's a reminder of God's faithfulness. It's a reminder of God's grace and mercy. It's a reminder of what God has done in us to transform us in such a way that we might be a blessing to the world around us. Every time we come to this table, we are reminded of what Jesus has done for us. And it can, if we allow it, empower us, enable us, encourage us a little bit further down the journey together. So welcome to this table this day. I remind you that on the night that Jesus was handed over, he took bread from the table, and after giving thanks to his heavenly Father, he broke the bread. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat, this do in remembrance of me. And then following the meal, he took the cup, the cup that we now know as the cup of the new covenant in Christ's blood, the new promise. And pouring it out, he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take drink, this also do in remembrance of me. And later the apostle Paul wrote that as often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you're proclaiming my death. You're proclaiming your faith and trust in what God had done in the redemptive work of Jesus to all. So the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you now to to take that uh, capsule that you got coming in, you know, peel off the side where the bread is. Wow, well, bonus, I have two in mind today. <laughs> the gifts of God. And then carefully peel off the back. Christ's blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. God, we are grateful for this meal. We're grateful for this reminder. We're grateful for your promised presence that we can see and experience in this, in this reminder of your faithfulness. So God, use it to minister us in a way that empowers us to live as you call us to, for we pray this in your name. Amen. Yeah. 
Brothers and sisters, as we bring our time of communion to a close, we get a chance to pray together. The communion prayer words are listed in your bulletin or up on the screen here. So I invite you to join in saying these words. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us in Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You know, as we come to this time in the service where we think about generosity and about being generous people, it's a chance for us to kind of recognize and remember or to hear about ways that generosity is happening in our midst and hopefully that inspires us to look for places where we can be more generous. For the past year uh, we have had a special choir meeting in our church. It's called the Giving Voice Choir. It came out of the inspiration of some of our members who had seen it in other places and actually had to help start it in other places and they thought we should have one of these choirs here for people who are struggling with memory issues, dementia and Alzheimer's. A chance for them to gather together and realize that some of the words of songs can bring back memories and connect them in ways that life distracts them. A chance for family members or other friends to partner with them and to have this experience together or to give them a little bit of a break. A number of our members have helped lead that group and they have helped support that group and actually have sung alongside them. We've actually had two wonderful uh, concerts. Uh, I went to both of them and I was blessed by both of them, watching the enthusiasm of these folks as they sang, recognizing each week they get together on Thursdays and they practice, enjoy that fellowship and friendship. Uh, just a blessed ministry in our midst. It's the ways that we try to be generous in this church. It's the ways that we try to be creative and find those places that we can make a difference. That's what being generous is all about, right? How can I muster what I have, who I am, how God has created me to make a difference? Of course, we do that in the sharing of our financial gifts. And of course, there's many ways that you can do that. You can do it on your phone, online. You can write a check and put it in the box in the comments. There's lots of ways you can make that transaction happen. And we're grateful for that. It's those gifts, your partners, us pooling our resources together that makes ministries like Giving Voice possible. Thank you. Thank you for being a generous church. Thank you for the ways that the Spirit has moved you and you have responded. And let's continue to look for those places. Let's continue to look for ways that we can do that together. If you want to know more about Giving Voice, you can stop out at the Connections Corner. You can stop out there anyway because you might want to find out some stuff about this church. You can do that, but also you can find out more about giving voice. 
because Chris Anderson will be at the table. So let me pray a blessing upon God's generous love for us and the ways that we can respond generous. God, thank you. Thank you for all that you have given us. Thank you that we can know that and recognizing that. Thank you that then you can lead us to be even more generous. Continue to use all that you've given us to make a difference for your glory. For we pray this in your name. Amen. Our next song is one of those old songs that we haven't sung for a long time, but it almost could be a prayer for us today. He's got the whole world in his hands. Let's stand and sing together. He's got the whole Yay, yay, yay. That was awesome. Dude, it was. I don't know. You guys sound like you're rusty. You guys sound like you're a little bit rusty. A little rusty. Yeah. I'm rusty. I kept throwing me off there. Uh, hey, words give life. Let's let our words give life. And I know it's hard. It's not easy. It's not easy for me, that's for sure. But God is with us. God has called us. God has empowered us. Let's step into that calling. Brothers and sisters, before I tell you to go in peace, there's bagels. So <laughs> go in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessings upon you. Amen. Amen. That's right. I got to get. <laughs>